hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of AIGA New York, championing the future of design for all. The full value of design can only be realized when all people can participate. And to create that future, we must build it together. Learn more at AIGANY.org. A lot of us get fired. I was fired twice. Invited to leave is even better. But if you play the game at that level, on a major magazine and you're the art director, it's like being a manager of a sports team. You're not going to laugh. You're going to be fired. So you have to enjoy every moment knowing that it could or would happen. And I've tried to do that, but it's always very damaging when it actually does happen. This is Print is Dead, Long Live Print, a podcast about magazines and the people who made and make them. I'm Deborah Bishop. I'm Patrick Mitchell. If you can count yourself among the lucky ones who've met Robert Priest in person, any chance you remember what you were wearing? Well, fear not. He does. According to his business partner, the designer Grace Lee, Priest possesses a near photographic memory of how people present themselves, and those first impressions last a lifetime. To hear him talk, though, it's not at all about being judgy. Priest is just naturally consumed with all things visual, he has been since childhood. He gets it from his mother. To him, design is everything. Priest has dedicated his 50 plus year career to the relentless pursuit of taste, style, and fashion, and it shows. He has led design teams at all of the big magazines GQ, House and Garden, In Style, Newsweek, and Esquire, twice. But there's another side to Robert Priest. He's a huge sports fan, and designing magazines, that's his sport. Indeed, like a head coach, he's hired to win. And the trophies in this case are readership, advertising, circulation, and buzz. And when that's all taken care of, the design awards start to pile up. They certainly have for him. In this episode, we talked to Priest about his early days in London, when he and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were just getting started, about why soccer is the real football, and about the rise and fall of one of the biggest magazine launches in history. Condé Nast portfolio. We're going to start at the beginning, Robert, if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about growing up in Middlesex. What was it like there growing up in the 50s and 60s? Well, yes. Yes, West London. It was quite near Heathrow. It was a very quiet, sleepy town, to be quite frank. My father worked for the public sector of the British government in the Ministry of Defence. He came from a working class family in Shepherd's Bush in London. Uh, he was in World War II in Italy and Libya. And according to my sister, who's 10 years older than me, he had a pretty bad time. It was just a rough experience leaving a three-year-old behind. And I think that really affected the rest of his life. My mother was the artistic one. She was essentially a homemaker. She made things, clothes mostly, literally all my clothes, except for my grammar school uniform. That lasted until I discovered Carnaby Street. It was a street off Regent Street in central London that kind of celebrated the new kinds of clothes that the 60s were about to explode. So then I went rogue on my mom and just went for that kind of clothing. I was just about to go to art school at that point, and it was really great for me. You were making a statement. I was making a statement. Was there a point where you, it was a eureka moment where you were like, oh, I have a special talent, or was that something that evolved? I felt two things. I felt that I was a leader, even though I was shy. And I felt that I had taste. My mother had taste, and I felt that I had taste. And I have been looking for good taste all my life, good tastes in, in almost everything, but mostly the way people look. I'm absolutely fascinated by people's faces. I should have been a portrait painter in the 13th century because I just love faces and the human figure. So that clothes idea was more decorating that human figure. And in those days, that's exactly what it was. And then I went to grammar school and I was a pretty decent student, but I did suffer from a little bit of anxiety, sometimes do less well than I expected to. But I was extremely lucky to have a charismatic art teacher called Elvett Thomas. And he left the school a year before me and moved to a purely art school called Twickenham College of Art. And he asked me to follow him. 
I'd done some paintings and drawings that he was impressed by. And he thought I had promise as an artist or a commercial artist, as they were known then. But I was staggered at the quality of painting and drawing at the school and quickly decided to study design. And there was a television graphics designer and illustrator called Bernard Blatch who joined the school and kind of revolutionized the design department while I was there. He had ideas sort of on the level of someone like Christoph Niemann now, not quite as genial as Christoph is, but still really good. And as a result of that, I've sort of always gravitated toward idea-based illustration rather than decoration. And there was a sort of exceptional student there called Colin Fulcher, who went on to become Barney Bubbles. You know about Barney oh, Bubbles? Yeah. He was an amazing designer in the 60s and created this underground newspaper called Oz, which is sort of a psychedelic looking, really interestingly printed. And you've never seen anything like that before. And it was very influential. It sort of changed everybody's point of view about print, quite honestly. And Barney also went on to design Elvis Costello's albums, My Aim is True and This Year's Model, and Joe Jackson's Look Sharp. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? It would yes, be Pointed Shoes On. Well, actually, that one was actually shot in my house by Brian Griffin. I'd moved to Toronto sometime later, but he rented my house, Brian did, and shot the album cover there. Going back to childhood, what was the first magazine that you actually remember where it actually got you thinking about what a magazine was and if it interested you at all? Well, as a young child, I used to be influenced by football magazines, and that was a bit of the influence that made me start 8x8. But after that, I would say the great Esquire period. I mean, I wasn't a real kid. I was a teen, but those George Lois covers were working in England as much as they worked here, and so so staggeringly different from everything else you saw. I, I don't think the inside was designed that well as a piece of design. Some of the art was good. But yes, that was a massive influence on me. I mean, God, you were essentially in the room where it happened. You were a contemporary of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and everything that was going on in London in the 60s. How did that affect your life? Well, there was a certain part of my life. Twickenham was very near Richmond. And in 1963, I used to go to see the Rolling Stones before they'd made a record every week on Sunday night from June to September of that year. So 20 or 30 times, they hadn't written any songs yet. They were just playing Bo Diddley and Muddy Waters music. And you're standing right next to them because the stage is about a foot high and there's 300 people in a very low ceiling room. I was a Stones person and not a Beatles person, although not the Beatles, I just, Stones just had this energy. For you're me. either one or the other. You are really, yeah. You've always been an immaculate dresser, Robert, and obviously interested in style. So did you look like? The Rolling Stones? I would love to I see did. a picture. I did. I did. How much velvet did you wear? <laughs> no, what it was, everybody, literally everybody wore a gray sweater, Mick Jagger too, a pink gingham shirt, and pinstripe flared pants, and those shoes that the Beatles used to wear from Manello and David, kind of high heel on them. Yeah, <laughs> I was exactly <laughs> that person, embarrassingly enough. And did you have a beetle cut or your no, hair? my mum made me a beetle jacket once, those ones that button up to the top. But my hair never did that. It all sort of went, it's gone now, but it was just swing to one side. It just didn't look like Paul McCartney at all. Very oh, disappointing. That's all, but that's always good when it has a little <laughs> movement. But Carnaby Street, is that what established your fascination with fashion and style? Yes, very much so. And there was King's Road in Chelsea that started a number of shops selling things handmade or just very different from anything anybody was wearing. I had friends, Pat Booth and James Wedge, who were a couple, and he did some work for me. But we became very good friends. They actually made the frock <laughs> that Mick Jagger wore on the Hyde Park concert a couple of days after Brian Jones died. He was singing in this white, sleek color length frock with some pants underneath it. You know, it was a very memorable concert because it was, I think, the first time they had the new guitarist, etc. Well, I'm, I'm swinging away from print here, Patrick. Well, it, it's all <laughs> fashion, right? Yeah, it is. I had a nice chat with your partner, Grace Lee, who you've been working with for several years, and she let me in on this uncanny skill you have. She says, Robert can remember literally what everybody was wearing every time he ever met them. If that's not quite true, but you have a sort of photographic memory for people's clothing, yeah. 
she told me that she said that. And so I was trying to remember what you wore when you visited my studio. But I had gotten. I don't want to remember what I was wearing. <laughs> I had a baby. Unfortunately, now for everyone who's listening who's met you, they're going, "Oh my God, what was I wearing that day?" <laughs> In 1977, you jumped to Canada, across the pond. Why did you decide to leave London, and how did you end up working at Weekend Magazine in Toronto? Well, I was working at Radio Times, the BBC magazine, and David Driver. This was the, actually the first time I was ever a number two. But I wanted to work with David because he was a genius. And I was working at Radio Times, and he was offered the job of Weekend Magazine in Toronto and went over to interview with John McFarlane, the editor. And I think that he gave every indication that he wanted to take the job. But when he came back, he changed his mind. And I, for what reason, I never understood. And somebody who's passing by Canada, who knew us both, recommended me to John McFarlane. And he came over to London to interview me at the Park Lane, and we got on famously. He remains a good friend and one of the best editors and smartest people I've ever met. So after that, I flew over and saw all those gold skyscrapers in Toronto, and I was sold. He even paid for me to go to New York to sort of check it out for potential contributors. Was that the first time you left the country? Not the country, but it's certainly the first time I'd come to North America, which just absolutely blew me away. With the glossiness of Toronto and New York was like taxi driver. It was really <laughs> grim, but Toronto was amazing. We had a 50-foot art department for like four of us and a gigantic wall for displaying the layouts and everything. Everything was first class, great views, great people, great editorial thinkers. Gary Ross was John's number two, who continues to be my good friend and sometimes editor of ABA. I, I had such a great time there. And I was able to bring Derek Unglis over. He had worked with me at Radio Times just after I joined. And he went on to be the art director of Vogue and Details and Rolling Stones. He had a pretty good career. And I've been very lucky. I had maybe five unbelievable number two designers, the second designer, as, as it were. But... Yeah, it was a social time. We did this cover for Weekend Magazine, the first one, I think, and it was Ralph Stepman illustrating a, a story about seal hunting, and he had done this very terrifying illustration of a woman on ice in a white fur coat made of seal, covered in blood, and Canadians weren't exactly ready for that. You, you <laughs> probably wouldn't remember it, but it was in your lifetime that if you hadn't left by then. Well, um, I remember Weekend Magazine. I don't know if I remember specifically that cover, but I can imagine. Well, it seemed to upset most of Canada. But, well, okay. I remember Weekend, and I think the, the covers and the design really stood out in those days. I don't think there was anything quite as good in Canadian publishing. The covers are simple and beautiful and ahead of their time. Was there a brief that you got from the editors at the time, or were there influences there were definitely influences. I think John McFarlane wanted the magazine to be a little bit more conservative than I made it. And that's one of the reasons I hired Derek, because he's a kind of beautiful, but quieter designer. But I wanted to push it on. Roger Black was doing some pretty fantastic stuff at Rolling Stone then, and really displaying type beautifully. And I wanted to not copy him at all, but just sort of try and do my version of that, try and make typography front and center, as well as the art. So it's a sort of double whammy. Um, assigning unbelievable illustrators from all over the world, which also pissed off the Canadians. But John McFarlane's point was, and uh, he was delighted, that if a young Canadian illustrator is a few pages away from Milton Glaser or Jim McMullen or Seema Quast, that's very exciting and inspirational for the young Canadians. And we never worked with Anita, although I wish we had. She was a bit young then, but we worked with somebody called Blair Drawson, who was amazing, totally fantastic. And all the contributors were pretty great, I have to say. Yeah. I remember Blair Drawson, really amazing artist and hugely influential Huge. in the United mm -hmm. States as well. I particularly love that italic logo. I think it still feels quite modern. Did you work on that? I did. I didn't design it. Tom Carnacy designed it, who's Herb de Balance number two, basically. They had a company together, and I went to see him when I first came over to New York. And the rough he did with it, in pencil, you could publish it. It was perfect. And we didn't even change it. We just said yes. 
It was so <laughs> good. It's right back in style. It's beautiful. Yeah. From my research, it looks like it was a newspaper supplement. Yes. A supplement that went to 50 newspapers across Canada. In Toronto, is the Globe and Mail. In Montreal, the Montreal Standard. Every so week? Went, what, every week? Yeah. So I did about 100 of them. That's an accelerated course in magazine design. It really was. What was and the magazine design community like in Toronto? Were you guys kind of an island there on your own? And who were your contemporaries there? Well, you probably know Louis Fischoff, who was doing some nice work. He was sort of a competitor. And there were a couple of other supplements that I think were a bit taken aback by what we were doing. So I'm not sure how they felt about it. And we used to win quite a lot of awards at the Art Directors and National Magazine Awards. So I'm not sure that I was the world's most popular person there. It did, I think, move things on a little bit. And that's important. Multiple people have told me you're competitive and I can see that it's coming out right now. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm especially competitive at sport, I have to say. But you so, know, you want to you want to win. But if you don't, I'm not sure that you should be doing it. I think there are three of us all feeling kind of the same way. You know, yeah, yeah. Peer recognition is a powerful thing. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a stroking the ego. Was it always in the back of your mind though that you might want to go to New York? No, but I was like everybody else in my circle we were fascinated by it. it it was kojak on tv and it was in all the movies <laughs> and it was just magical even at its dirtiest and grimiest when i got there it, it was magical still is but uh, you know i've moved to brooklyn now just because manhattan is a bit too intense in a different much different way from when i first went there the you know the odeon restaurant that had just opened and you would go in and there would be robert de niro and harvey keitel very frequently yes, having dinner together and they were terrifying yeah. really muscular guys who look like they want to kill you boy has it changed it now seems to be a place strictly for millionaires or billionaires almost oh, certainly yeah yeah we'll be right back print is dead is made possible with the support of mag culture read our online journal listen to our podcast and visit our shop to discover why we're convinced print is very much alive. All available at magculture.com. Print is Dead is made possible by the support of the Society of Publication Designers. The SPD powers the future of visual storytelling, setting the standard for editorial excellence, and shaping the future of visual culture. For more information, visit spd.org. So moving on to Esquire V1. Yeah. This has come up many times, almost exclusively with men. It seems to me, and it's true for me too, that every man in this business shares a passion or a desire to work at Esquire. It's kind of the nirvana of magazines. And it seems like obviously you've worked there not once, but twice. That's true for you too. Yeah. Obviously it depends on who's there editing it, but it, it was very glamorous. First time around, it was different, though, because it had just been bought by those guys from 1330. I think you had some association with them, didn't you, Patrick? They um, did, the, yeah. Moffitt and Christopher Whittle. And they were my age, so they just bought Esquire. And I was, what, 33 or something. And Walter Bernard sort of orchestrated the move down for me and asked me to come and meet Philip. And I liked him. He was really honest and straightforward. He could give a shit about the whole history of Esquire. He wanted to do a magazine for the new man that was sort of beginning to emerge called a yuppie. And he did so. And he was working with some of the most amazing editors you could possibly imagine. Our art department bullpen was right next to the editor's area. And I was my first job without there. I'm looking at Byron DeBell and Lee Eisenberg, fucking legends. Lee was mentoring Adam Moss at the time. He was about 10 years old. Byron DeBell was mentoring Dominique Browning, who hasn't done too badly either. And they were assigning Tom Wolfe and Gay Talese and Gore Vidal. And Philip didn't mind that at all, as long as he could understand it fitting into his vision. And I've noticed that the best editors, I'm not saying he was really the best editor, but he was very focused on what he wanted the magazine to be. And it became that. You're you know, talking about Lee Eisenberg. Lee Eisenberg. Yeah. Absolutely. Genius guy. David Granger told us that he felt like Esquire under Philip Moffat, which was also when you were there, was maybe the best era of Esquire ever. Oh, that's bizarre. I mean, I would say uh, Harold Hayes or Arnold Gingrich, but okay. Uh, his own as well. But in the same way that you credit George Lois at Esquire for getting you into this, 
you did the same for me. I first learned of Esquire and you when I started buying it when I was in college. I think you were there. And I would say you were the reason I pursued my career in magazine design. But the ones I remember, and tell me if this was you or I know your number two, April Silver, ended up taking over at some point. But the things I remember most were the series of 50th anniversary issues that you guys did. Was that while you were there? Yeah. The first one was my last issue. The big gold one? And the gold one was the one April did. April was just, again, I was talking about number two. She was fantastic. And I inherited her. I didn't hire her. And she was a brilliant designer, but also designed herself. She would, she would just wear the most beautiful clothes every day. Also had Stephen Doyle working for me. <laughs> I inherited him too. And he's a really funny guy, a kind of insubordinate in a good way, if that's possible. He had great ideas, shared my enthusiasm for David Byrne at Talking Heads. So we parted a lot in each other's apartment. But it was a very nice mood there. It just couldn't be better to have that as my first job in New York because I was a bit isolated. I didn't really know what to do. So the work really consumed me. Well, it was also at a time I've been doing a lot of research of 60s and 70s magazines. And these magazines that we remember from that era so fondly and lovingly, as you were saying earlier, the covers were one thing, but the insides were not super thought out. I'm sure for a million reasons and limitations and realities, but your Esquire back in the 80s really seemed cover to cover to be so carefully designed and thought out. And it appeared to me that April just continued the work you had been doing. So it lasted a long time. It was just really something. It did. As I said, April was really a very special person. Yeah. And we had a look and we also had a, 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 a certain kind of illustration we assigned and a certain kind of photography we assigned. For photography, it was more like trying to do an album cover, making it a bit more mysterious, less straightforward. And the illustrations just been a little, not exactly darker, but just really thoughtful. And people were illustrating fiction, which is always fun. But there was several other things. I was also influenced by Jean-Paul Goode's Esquire, actually, the guy who did all those Grace Jones photographs. He worked with us, actually, and he made a difference. His work was just very spectacular and I think probably continues to be over in Paris. But yeah, it was a great time. And I was so disappointed when April left the business. She was in the running for New York Woman with Betsy Carter, who was a very good friend of her. But for some reason, they took Fabienne Baron, which, I mean, you can understand, but it was kind of odd. I thought she was going to just walk into that and make that magazine her own, and then she would have her own reputation, as it were. You know, it's not often that a designer from Canada gets a huge opportunity to move to New York. Someone must have really seen the great job that you're working on at Weekend. Do you remember getting that call? What was that uh, well, like? I remember talking to Walter Bernard about it and then to Philip Moffat about it. I, I had no phone call other than Walter's, and he just said, come down. <laughs> and what amazing. am I going to do? Yeah, that was obviously amazingly exciting and I think disappointing to have to leave such good friends. But if you're off at Esquire, what can you do? What did art directors get paid in those days? Oh, that's a really good question. I think I got 30000 when I went to Canada. And I think when I came down, it moved to about 50000 which is pretty good then. Interesting. So we pretty much know what the brief was at Esquire. Well, it, what was the brief? They wouldn't have hired me if they weren't expecting some different kinds of typography. So something unusual, something with its own identity that's really strong but can relate to these 30-something yuppies that were emerging. And part of it was to do with New York getting cleaned up a little bit. And I think there was sort of more ambition. We did a piece on Joe Biden, actually, when I was there. Well, we're targeting the Reagan years, so. Yeah, 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 that was interesting. But no, it was a very straightforward brief, actually. Um, We bent it as much as we could, and we were allowed to do that. Were you explicitly asked to do a redesign? Oh, yeah, because it was Clay Felker's magazine, and it was a bi-weekly at that point. So we took it back to being a monthly, and you kind of had to do a different look because... It was a more permanent, not exactly a coffee table magazine, but it was just a more permanent feel to it rather than the sort of, and I'm, this is not an insult, but the sort of more dispensable two-week cadence. I had a nice conversation with Bob Newman the other day, and he took me back to those days, and we both agreed that you were hugely influential to both of us, and, and I'm sure 
a bunch of others, but he pointed out something that seems insignificant now, but knowing how editors and designers related back then, it was very contentious, pretty much universally. He wanted to give you credit for inventing the opening spread that did not have text on it. Oh, yeah. Well, in two ways. One, that the story began on the following spread, but also that, and other people have said this too, that prior to when you came along, people were much less respectful of illustration and photography and would slap type all over them. But you created that balance of letting the art do its thing and doing something typographically on the opposite spread, which again, seems so common now, but was just revolutionary at the time. Well, I didn't realize that that was me. But yeah, it was something that I still have battles about. I've managed to persuade a lot of editors over the years that's a good way of creating a, a real look rather than have to start a story on the opening spread. I think Fred and you, Deb, did amazing work with that as a sort of model. So yeah, it's absolutely what I wanted to do. And wherever I go or whatever magazine I design, I'm always encouraging that. It doesn't always work, but... I would say I, I got an 80% record on that one. Made it much easier for the rest of us. Well, good of you. As say. I recall, you have a great skill for recognizing talent in designers, obviously, but also in illustrators and photographers. Do you have a formula for making good commissions? How do you get inspired? That's a like really good question, Deb. Mostly, I like to give as much freedom as I can. There's been a movement over the last 15 years of basically illustrators being told via the editor, but not by the editor, that this is what we want the illustration to look like. And that's really disappointing for me. I think the art directors have to sort of stick up for themselves and say, well, no, we can come up with a better idea than that. Or this illustrator can come up with a better idea than that. And the compromise, the early compromise was, okay, let's do the editor's idea and then let's do another sketch that is our idea. And inevitably, we were able to persuade the editors to go with our idea once they saw it. So yeah, I, I mean, that's not across the board, but there's a lot of illustration that is dire because of that sort of dictatorship that can be prevalent in American magazines sometimes. Mm -hmm. I agree. You designed Esquire under three different logos I was on the Esquire cover archive. The one you inherited in 1979 was a real dog. It was. Who so, do we have to blame for that? I'm not even sure I know, and I wouldn't tell you if I did, but it was awful. But that was Clay Felker's Esquire. Yeah. But the new slash retro logo, which appeared in 93, was kind of groundbreaking in that not a lot of magazines were looking back as Esquire did. But I will say the logo that you created, that first sort of script logo after the Felker, boy, do I like that. I really want it to come back. Can you talk about how that was created and who you worked with? Well, we worked with Tom Canese again, because as Deb said, the Weekend Magazine logo was so beautiful. And so he did it. And it was just a little twist on the classic, but enough of a twist to have its own personality. And again, drawn in pencil. You just, you couldn't believe that that's possible with Tom Canace's work. And it, it was such an honor to work with him. One of the great typographers along with Herb Ballon, his partner. Who gets to do that? <laughs> and what was the response when well, it appeared? Every, everybody loved it because although it was memorable from previous times, it was new. It's still fairly fresh. And everybody's tweaked it a little bit during the last 30 years or whatever it is. And that's how it is. Everybody wants to have their own tweak. Fair enough. But I, I do like that one too. What was Esky's status in your first period of Esquire? He, he was he was banned, essentially. <laughs> he was old school for our yuppies. Well, a byproduct of your arrival in New York was the creation, along with Edward Booth Cliburn and Julian Allen and Marshall Arisman and Steve Heller of American Illustration. Can you tell us how that came to be and how it became the steamroller that it ended up being? Well, I was very good friends with Julian Allen. He had been brought over by Milton Glaser to do those illustrations for New York Magazine of situations often on Watergate where the uh, people were talking behind closed doors and never photographed. And he recreated those moments very effectively for Milton and New York Magazine. And we just became good friends. We used to go to see The Clash all the time and CBGBs and Mug Club and things like that. And 
My friendship with Julian led to us talking to Edward Booth Cliburn, who we knew from London, who ran DNAD, the Designers and Art Directors Association, and European Illustration from London, and asked him to come over. And we suggested, let's do an American illustration version of that European illustration. And we got together with Marshall and Steve Heller and Sue Ko, actually, and we put it together. And the really sad thing is that I've been to nearly every party that they've thrown <laughs> since 1982. There's a passionate leader, Mark Heflin, I think we all know, and he's a wonderful guy who's kept it going and developed it. And I just really think he's moved it on beautifully. It's such a joy when I look at illustrator's sites and see them highlighting their work that got into American illustration. It just feels really good. Your work at Esquire led to several other high-profile positions at Newsweek, Us Magazine, GQ, House and Garden, and even a second tour at Esquire. We worked together on the relaunch of House and Garden. Can you talk about that? It was kind of a big deal at the time. House and Garden was coming back from the dead. It was, and I think it was the time that James Truman had taken over from Alexander Lieberman. The best thing about it for me, apart from just having the pleasure of working with you every day, was the incubation period at the beginning where we just talked about it. We did this at Portfolio too later, but the idea of having a year to just think about what a magazine should be. And there was an all-star cast. Dominic Browning was the editor who I'd worked with at Esquire. Susie Slesson was number two from the New York Times. And Laura Zerubin was the food editor, who was brilliant. David Carey was the publisher. I mean, it was a pretty talented bunch. <laughs> and it's as I said, the idea of having that amount of time to think it through and think out how the photography should look and how the magazine should look. I'm not sure whether you were part of that, Deb, that incubation period. I had trouble getting you away from Fred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember it being a very long time, but I, I probably wasn't part of the very early Part. Yeah, I remember exactly. going to Dominique Browning's place in Rhode Island. Oh, that, yeah, that, well, that was part of it. That was it? That was the incubation? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that was part of it. And I slept in a hotel or a house with a ghost in it. I've never <laughs> seen a ghost before. So that was something from the past. I've forgotten about that. <laughs> but Dominique, she just had great, wonderful taste. And that's what drew me toward her even though at the end of the day, she did let me go. And I was stunned because I really thought Dominique liked working with me as I did with her. And that hurt a lot. And it was either Cy or James Truman who might have suggested it. I've never been able to believe that she did that because we got on so well, but I'll never know. And I think, as you said, Deb, on one of the podcasts that you guys have done, a lot of us get fired. And I was fired twice. Invited to leave is even better. Very common in magazine publishing. It is. If you play the game at that level on a major magazine and you're the art director, it's like being a manager of a sports team. You're not going to last. You're going to be fired. So you have to enjoy every moment knowing that it could or would happen. And I've tried to do that, but it's always very damaging when it actually does happen. Pretty shocked and amazed at how much time they actually gave us to redesign House and Garden. I'm not actually sure it was a great thing. How do you feel about that? Well, it was a great thing for me because I was able to work under no pressure with people who are extremely talented. So what's the downside? They're paying you the same amount and you expected to come up with something special. And in a way we did. Certainly that first cover, that gold first cover that Elam Rubin shot with Jeffrey Miller styling it was really wonderful. And it sold sales with Condé Nast, of course. So they started off with a bang, and if there's any drop at all, everything starts getting questioned. It's hard to continue that level, for sure. And you're doing interiors, and if, if you don't get that right, it's tricky. But I, I feel like the sales dominate everything, obviously. The amount of time you're saying you had to create this really showed in the work. For years, I carried your issues of House and Garden with me in the slew of magazines that followed me from place to place. And at some point, I decided I just can't do this anymore. So I started scanning some things. But <laughs> even that was difficult because your design was so detailed that you even designed the gutters. Well, we did magazines. design the gutters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I remember like, that. It's not easy to tear those pages out yeah, and we, preserve the gutters. <laughs> We realized that the designing the gutters was a bad idea. Remember yeah. that, Robert? Yeah, we did. <laughs> That's probably what got you fired. 
<laughs> Maybe, actually. <laughs> well, one last thing on that. Check out Deb's layout of a house in California that Dewey Nick shot. It's the best layout that was ever done in House and Garden. It's spectacular. Speaking of bad endings, in our episode 24, Steve Heller and Bob Siano were joking about the way art directors and editors got fired. They said it was a sport back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Bob told a story of getting fired, a new editor getting hired, him getting rehired, and then him getting fired, and then the new editor getting fired. Yeah. All kind of a sequence of things. But what was your worst? We've all been fired. What was your worst getting fired experience? I would say not Dominique, and just because, I don't know, I just couldn't, I've never been able to accept it. But the only other time I was fired was when, at the end of Esquire 2, as it were, Granger basically wanted a magazine that had never been seen before. And this happened in about June, and we'd just won five gold awards at SBD. And it, it was me and Rockwell Harwood and some other good designers, but it was pretty unusual looking. And he wanted to take it in a different direction, which everybody says. But I think he wanted a magazine that's never been seen before. And as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't so much different when John Corpix was doing it. And when David Cucurito was doing it, they did instigate that type-heavy, hand-drawn, tons of type on the cover that probably hasn't been seen before. So if that's what he meant, fine. But I was thinking it would be more to do with the whole thing, the holistic Esquire, rather than just covers. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Issues Magazine Shop. Much like this podcast, we exist to celebrate the people and projects keeping print alive. We sell a mix of independent and commercial titles from around the world, shipping globally from our retail shop in Toronto, Canada. Visit us online at issuesmagshop.com. Stack, their independent magazine club, delivers a different publication every month to our subscribers all around the world. You never know what we're going to send next, but you do know it will be a beautiful, intelligent, independent magazine that deserves a place on your shelf. We'd love to start sending something your way, so go to stackmagazines.com to sign up and start receiving a surprise magazine every month. Everyone knows about the excesses at Condé Nast. I was talking to Karen Frank and she talked about working at Condé both before and after the crash. And I think you've done that too. And she was just so shocked that very little seemed to have changed after the crash. She said there was still a crush of town cars lined up at the entrance. Oh, really? Wow. You've worked at all the big publishers. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you, the differences between Time, Hearst, Meredith, and Condé, and how that affected the way you worked at each place? Well, it was most fun at Condé, I have to tell you, because they spent the most money on the most ridiculous things, like the fashion assistants taking there was a car company that everybody used in all magazines and they had the excuse of returning clothes, so that's fine. But yeah, money was just flowing when I first got there in, I think, 1988. For a couple of years, there was some big goings on. Everybody was spending a ton of money on expenses and all of that stuff. There was one art director who I will not name who had dinner in the Odeon every night and claimed it, which is pretty good. Uh, to me, it was never the same at Hearst. It wasn't that they didn't throw money around, but it just was that it, it, it could never be that time again. It was really a moment. Steve Florio, the publisher, was there. Mad Dog, another publisher, I'm forgetting the name. The publishers were almost the biggest stars as the editor, and they were flashy. And they were good, actually. And they were magazines. They were thick then. And then the crash happened. It happened when I was at Portfolio, and ridiculously, we didn't really predict it. it just happened while we were doing an issue. Where you were out to dinner. Yeah, we were out to dinner, yeah. But that was shocking. It was shocking because it really signaled the end of magazines or the beginning of the end of very highly paid photographers getting $10,000 a cover. Gone. Yeah. You, you're earning yeah. 10000 next day you're earning nothing. You were at GQ when we launched Fast Company, and I was talking to Karen about this, and I remember we were trying to figure out what do you spend on a monthly newsstand magazine, and I did some research on what GQ was paying, and I said, Karen, is this true that what I believe we found out was that the monthly art budget for GQ was somewhere between 300 k and unlimited? And she said, 
Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, yeah, I mean, it could be right. I didn't know that. She said, we literally assigned every piece of art from cover to cover. Yeah, there wasn't really a budget. Um, what a privilege to be in that position. It was fabulous. Speaking was of extravagant, what was the best perk that you ever got, Robert? The most dramatic perk that actually I came to think was embarrassing was to have a driver pick you up in the morning and take you home. I think that was at GQ. And whilst it was just wonderful on one hand, I sort of lost touch. I was never on the subway. I lost touch with humanity. And it just ended up being embarrassing coming out and you're getting into a car and your pals are going down the subway. It was just ridiculous. So I think that was both the best and the worst. <laughs> Patrick asked me what my perk was, and I said the same thing. But I didn't say that I lost touch with humanity. If I lost <laughs> touch with humanity, it was because I was getting car service home between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning because yeah. I was working. Where were you living then? I lived in Hoboken, so uh -huh. it was just across the river. But okay, I was working at Rolling Stone. We used to have oh. very late hours there. Yeah. It showed. Yeah. <laughs> really nice work. Of all the magazines, other than 8x8, which was the most fun to work on? Well, Weekend Magazine in Toronto, actually. The staff was incredibly supportive of what Derek and I were doing. The conditions were fabulous. Well, they did give me a perk. They <laughs> leased me a Trans Am, a white oh. Trans Am without the eagle on the front because I didn't want to be flashy. <laughs> but I did want to go really fast. And that was most spectacular. And where um, did you drive it? Well, I was caught speeding in the airport. I mean, you just had to touch the pedal and you were going 60, 70, 80 yeah. miles an hour. So I was a bit careful. Not always that careful, but I've learned a big lesson about cars at that point. Everybody has their Art Cooper stories. We've gotten them in previous episodes. And I heard that was a difficult relationship for you. Do you have an Art Cooper story? I have an Art Cooper memory of the three martini and a bottle of wine lunches at the Four Seasons. When I say frequently, I mean very frequently. And it really upset the afternoon work because he, and if there are any GQ companions with him, are kind of different people. And you had to partake. Yeah, yeah. I went with him to the Four Seasons a couple of times, but it was nothing like a regular gig for him. I didn't want to drink at lunchtime, and he did. I mean, he did have his assistant bring him a tumbler of vodka at five o'clock every night. And he was pretty happy at the time, and he was much easier to deal with, but we all thought it was just a bit too much. And it didn't feel like a partnership to you? No. He wanted GQ to look like Vanity Fair, like Graydon's Vanity Fair. And they already did that. David Harris did it beautifully, but I don't know. The art is jealous of Graydon, but he certainly was influenced by Graydon's life and his charisma, and it was clear. It was clear that he wanted me to do a kind of more reserved, Look, but honestly, I don't think I did my greatest work at GQ. It was just too complicated. We can't finish this section without talking about portfolio, but uh, sort of as a precursor to that, John Corpix was telling me about the Fortune Bake Off that you both participated oh, in. Jesus, yeah. And he ended up getting the job, but he told me that he saw your presentation and his reaction was, I'm toast. Because it was so good, obviously. And, and I wonder, was your fortune, I never saw it, but was your fortune pitch sort of a preview of the portfolio design? No, I don't think so. If you're talking the, the fortune pitch I did, we sort of had a dance. We thought we did a nice job on that. I'm kind of pissed off that John got it, but he's a really good designer, so why not? Well, he also told me, and he's told me this before, that he thinks Portfolio was one of the most perfect magazines ever. Wow. That's really good to hear because I never, it's very hard to know if John likes you or your work. And that's because I basically only ran into him at SPD. And SPD award shows are, are, are sort of so tinged with tension, <laughs> the desire to get up there on the stage or at least pick up a medal. And I think emotions can take over, as they did with me just as much as anybody else. So as you were saying at House and Garden, portfolio was kind of a, all-star team. It seemed to be the launch that had everything behind it. It had a lot of money behind it, yeah. We had an incubation period there, and there was just maybe six of us. It was Joanne Lippman, the editor, and Jim Impoco, who was the assigning editor. Lisa Reger was the managing editor, and then a photo department of Lisa Berman and Sarah Zedlicki, 
and Grace and I. So that was about eight people. And it was the biggest launch at that point that we'd seen in quite a while and maybe have That's seen since. Probably ever. Can you talk a little bit about, about lifetime of portfolio? Well, the first part of it, the incubation period was where this small group that I mentioned had been hired to talk about what it should be and what it should stand for and what it should look like and what should it be called. We actually designed 300 logos for different names that people had suggested. That's a lot. <laughs> and then once we decided on portfolio, we designed a number of other typographic interpretations of the logo. So apart from designing sections for the front and some features and everything, that was the sort of first era within and then there was the era of dealing with Cy and Tom Wallace. So it was me, Joanne Lippman, and Cy and Tom Wallace in a room, again, talking about what it should be, but based on reality, based on what we've been producing, not only in design, but the words. And I have to say, Cy, who can be brutally frank, he really gave Joanne respect and space. But we were always seemingly under fire from media critics. Gorka used to really trash us almost on a daily basis, and Keith Kelly, too. It was battering, and it was mostly reserved for Joanne because people had decided Joanne wasn't quite right for the job. And if she wasn't, it was just because she was a newspaper person, not a magazine editor. And there's quite a, a different skill set required to be a magazine editor from a newspaper editor. And I think that's what tripped everybody over. It lasted, what, not quite two years? Yeah, about two years. Yeah. But it was three for me because of the years of incubation, which... Again, I can't emphasize if anybody ever gets the chance to do that, do it. All right. We're not going super chronologically here, but I do want to briefly touch on Esquire part two. So there was a 15 year gap, 15 years after leaving Esquire, you go back, which is just incredibly rare. It's like marrying the same woman twice. What were the circumstances that brought you back? Well, I guess the circumstance was that I was fired by David Granger and the person who took my job. Diana LaGuardia was the art director of Esquire at the time. So we swapped jobs. It was as simple as that. And again, this was with Ed Kozner who hired me, who was a longtime New York magazine and Newsweek editor. And I got there and basically you could feel it wasn't right. You could feel that he was going to be let go. And then they hired David Granger. And things went pretty well for a while. I was pretty excited about what we were doing. When I first started, Rockwell was in incredibly funny. He used to come in every morning and say, I can't do this. I'm just not good enough. I'm going to resign. I'm resigning. Goodbye. And honestly, every day for the first month I was there. <laughs> and of course, he was brilliant. And thanks to him, we did very well. Really thanks to him because he has such an unusual point of view. And I was never quite comfortable with Granger, although we worked together at GQ very well. And it's just one of those things. just didn't work out. But th there was no decision made about, oh, should I or should not go back? It was Esquire. And there's always an opportunity there to do something special. And not everybody makes it special, but it certainly the opportunity is there for the taking. Tell us about starting Priest Media, which you started in 1999, and then again as Priest and Grace 10 years later. Well, Priestpedia was a, re a reaction to not having a job, and I decided I would start my own business. It was risky, I thought, but we had a very nice, I rented a very nice space in Tribeca and had custom furniture made for it, the whole thing. And I took Peter Curry from InStyle Specials, where I think I was before that. And Peter Curry is a good designer for sure, and such a supportive man. He's now the design director of Hollywood Reporter. And then Chris Martinez, who is a wonderful designer who soon left to go to Barnes, but he made an incredible difference. He designed my website. But pretty soon afterwards, 9-11 happened. I was going to work, reached my office at 285 West Broadway and saw the first plane fly by into the building. I'm not sure that I ever recovered from that. Interestingly, one of our clients, I'm not going to say who, and I'm not going to say who the person was, but... He asked me to actually present that afternoon. We had done a redesign for a magazine and they wanted to see it that afternoon, which just blew my mind. But it was a struggle to get work in the beginning, for sure. But we certainly tried very hard. It's really just me finding the work or the phone would ring, basically. But managed to kind of get going a little bit after a little struggle to begin with, doing 
sort of more fun magazines. There was a magazine called Hollywood Life that a friend of ours knew the editor of and managed to get that looking quite nice. And a few other things. It was just a tricky period, honestly. I mean, I feel that everything at Priest Media revolved around 9-11. But I, I did a lot of sort of business magazines for smaller companies, which is a way to make money. That still seems to be part of our workload at Priest and Grace. Priest and Grace was a completely different proposition because for the first time I had a partner and I couldn't believe what a relief that was. So you can share the responsibility. On your own, it's pretty tricky, no matter how well-known you might be. you still got to rely on people wanting you to design, and mostly it was designing magazines at that point. So you just had to work the room a little bit. But with Grace, I hired her as a designer when I was designing Oh at Home. And that was a priest media thing. And the first time I'd ever worked with Oprah. And she came in as the third designer behind Ed Levine, who's, as we know, is great. And Angela Rikers, who is a really good designer also. But there was just too much work. So we hired Grace. And I could see from the very beginning that she had incredible talent. And the other thing about her is that she's so nice to be around. She's one of those rare people who have a smile on her face all the time. And it helps. It's just like... You go into the office and you're feeling good about things. And actually, we got every reason to because we did get and have got a lot of work. And so the difference being on your own versus sharing the responsibility, essentially. And it's a godsend. And you do it on your own, don't you, Patrick? I do. Yeah. You know what it's like and you've done extremely well under those conditions. And I didn't feel good about it, honestly. By the time you got to Priest and Grace... (laughs) Do you think you had sort of consciously or subconsciously sworn off being on staff ever again? I mean, a lot comes with that. It does. I mean, we did design Oprah's 10th anniversary issue because I think you were there and didn't have time to do so. I I was unavailable due to being fired. Oh, well, I was never sure of those circumstances, but yeah, that was horrible. Well, at the end of that, we redesigned the magazine after the 10th anniversary issue and presented to Oprah. It was just classic moment in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in LA and going up to the 14th floor, which I'm pretty sure was occupied wholly by Oprah. And a personal assistant took us through about 10 rooms and there was Oprah at the end of it. We had really loved what we'd done, including what we thought was a brilliant new logo, a bejeweled logo. And you were working with Susan Casey. Yeah. And she was great. The absolute greatest thing about her is that she was previously an art director outside and Sports Illustrated for kids. So she understood how art people should be treated or could be treated if you wanted to get the best out of them. And she was a pleasure. She was a delight. And Oprah just looked like this better be good because she doesn't want to waste a single second of her time. And she loved it. She loved the new logo. And later, Kathy Black, a president of Hearst, did, and Ellen Levine and Mike Clinton. But we could never persuade the top hierarchy to change the logo. So I was really disappointed by that. Yeah, we did her first iPad with all those bells and whistles that used to be on that kind of platform. But it was a pleasure working with Susan, that's for sure. Well, of all of the wonderful things to come out of Priest and Grace, which we'll be happy to show on our website, Maybe the coolest thing is when you put on a different hat and launched, created, founded a magazine that you edit, design, and produce (laughs) all on your own, along with, I'm sure, help. But I I wanted to ask you, before we get to 8x8, on your timeline, I noticed you had done Howler right before. Yeah. And so what was your involvement with Howler, another soccer magazine? Well, we had started the company and we needed something to occupy us and also a promotional piece for ourselves. But I really love soccer, football, and Grace and I just got together and decided that we wanted to do it. We went to England and interviewed writers for it and came back just thinking through. But we found a person who was an intern at Condé Nast Portfolio, actually, and he had a friend and they were thinking of starting a magazine. So we combined forces with them controlling the edit and us, the visual side. And we produced two issues of Aula, which were pretty nice, but we were unhappy with the vision. I just felt I knew a lot more about football than the editors did. And so the competitive robber decided to crush them. Yeah, but the whole thing ended pretty badly. But not to be deterred, we found it 8x8. 
And our vision for that was to create a visual energy like the one you experience at a Premier League football match where you have the excitement of supreme skills, the noise of the crowd, the drama, the language of the fans, which is fabulous, and the sheer spectacle of it. And editorially, we wanted to be just a little bit more political and humorous. And other social commentary about the aspects of the game, the inequities, the corruption, the way the game is developed worldwide. But it was just a really, a, at its core, it was a celebration of the game, the players, coaches, fans, and the history. So I feel like we were on the right course. It's just very hard to do. It took us six weeks to design it. And that's six weeks out of making profit, really. And we were doing at most, I think, four a year, but mostly three and sometimes two. It was tricky, very tricky. The responsibilities were interesting in a way because becoming an editor, I was assigning all the writing, but I was also assigning all the illustrations and photography and finding all the pickup. And Grace pretty much designed every page of the magazine. I doubt that I designed more than six features in this whole existence. And she's super fast, wonderful designer, obviously. And she handled the business side. So it was a real sort of equal, still is an equal footing. And we're basically equal in the company. And I find that's the only acceptable way of doing it. 8x8 is no longer in print. Are you still excited about doing a digital version of it? The pandemic basically killed a print version because the cost of paper and printing and distribution was so high. It almost doubled. And the fact that at that point we weren't allowed to ship to Canada and Europe just made up our minds for us. But in answer to your question... I still want to break that thing that really nobody has broken, making a magazine. The great thing about opening magazines is those spreads, and you both did those as well as anybody. Those moments haven't really happened digitally for me, but I still feel that there's a way of doing it. And one of the things we've run into is templating, you know, to do things and get them out quickly. Everything's going to be on a template. But I still think there's a way of doing it that is yet to crystallize in terms of how to do it, but just something that doesn't exactly replicate the old magazine style, but has the excitement, the visual excitement. Yeah. Do you feel that there's any magazines that are able to do a successful digital version? The whole reason I launched this thing was sort of to commiserate on and answer the question of, as I told Grace, that for all these decades, really the most creative people in the world were in the magazine business. And the creation of a magazine, the skills that go into it, the types of work that go into it may never exist again. To this point, online design is not capable of showing that kind of work. Although, shout out to our OG sponsor, ReadyMag, which I have not really played with that much, but I know you guys do. Yeah, we use it a lot. They've made a tool that I think comes the closest to allowing people to create. I think maybe mostly typography is the thing that's missing online. It is. But they allow you to do that. But also the format for a phone is vertical and most people yeah. receive their information on a phone. So that's the tricky part. I want to thank you for sharing your career chronology. It was jaw dropping. I actually had to print it out because it was too long to scroll. But just looking at the volume of jobs and clients and different kinds of work and doing the math in my head, I'm guessing you're about 106. I am. I just turned, had the birthday on Monday, 106 <laughs> years old. But seriously, what is your plan moving forward? Are you the type that's going to die while exporting a PDF for a client? Sadly, I am. <laughs> that's a horrible way of putting it. But yeah, I don't, I don't really want to retire. I still feel quite Sorry, young. Sorry, Robert. That, that yeah, was not that's my question. Well, it, there's a genuine thought behind that. And I agree. In this podcast, we've been talking to people from every generation of magazine design, but I think it's true for all people in our profession. I'm probably speaking for Deb too. This work is too much fun to stop. I assume you feel the same way. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, would you rather be golfing? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I would prefer to be working because that's going to keep your mind more stimulated. But, you know, Paul McCartney is over 80. So is Mick Jagger. So why would anybody stop working? Exactly. Keep I going, thing, Robert. Right? So our tradition at the end of our episode is to ask the print is dead billion dollar question. And that is that a very rich person, Laureen Powell Jobs, Jeff Bezos, has an offer that you can't refuse. They want to give you a blank check with one caveat. You have to use it to create and launch a print magazine. What would you do? First of all, jokingly, but I would do it by 2.0 properly. But failing that, 
Jeff is going to like this. I would do a magazine on aerospace, very visual one, all about the science, the equipment, the sort of blind ambition, the greed, but also beautifully designed a completely new way. I mean, the equipment and just the look of everything in aerospace is so beautiful. And I would employ on contract Spencer Lowell, Dan Winters, and Benedict Redgrove in London to do the photography. And it would be like a coffee table book. It would be thick with information about the science and everything. For more information on Robert Priest, visit priestandgrace.com or at priestandgrace on Instagram. If you'd like to connect more deeply with our guests, be sure to visit our website where we have complete transcripts of all our interviews, along with portfolios, archival photos, links, and other great information. Visit longliveprint.co slash interviews for more. In other news, we've got swag. Yep, you can get Print is Dead merch on our site at longliveprint.co slash shop. All purchases go directly to supporting the podcast. Check back often. We're adding new stuff all the time. And finally, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter by using the form on our homepage. It's the best way to stay up to date on all of the Print is Dead news and to receive advance notice on the latest episodes. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a member of the Hub and Spoke Audio Collective, a nonprofit association of audio storytellers dedicated to promoting and sustaining high quality independent podcasting, including Open Source, the world's first podcast. Hosted by public radio legend Christopher Lydon, Open Source circles the big ideas in culture, the arts, and politics with the smartest people in the world. It's the kind of curious, critical, high energy conversation we're all missing nowadays. Listen at radioopensource.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Print is Dead Long Live Print is made possible by support of listeners like you. If you'd like to contribute to keeping the podcast going, there are two easy ways. One, become a sustaining patron by making a monthly donation. Or two, make a one-time donation in the amount that works best for you. Visit printisdead.co slash support for more information. Print is Dead Long Live Print is a production of Modus Operandi Design. For more information, visit our website, printisdead.co. Or if you're an optimist, longliveprint.co. Follow us on social media at printisdeadpod. Please give us a like and a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps. Thanks very much for listening.